May the blessing of Jesus Christ come to us, warming our hearts and brightening our way. May Jesus, our Savior, bring light into the darkness of our world and to us this first Sunday of Christmas. Hello, everyone. Welcome to worship at St. Andrew's United Church in Hamilton. This service is for Sunday, December 27th, Christmas. I'd like to welcome any visitors that we may have with us today, and we hope that you find your time with us today both refreshing and nurturing. All of our services since the beginning of the COVID-19 quarantine are on YouTube and available for you at any time. My name is Alan Bowden. I'd like to thank Bob Shantz for delivering today's message on religion, faith, and identity. Ken McDonald enjoys another week off today, and Laurie White has prepared some slides documenting our most recent Inside Out Church and some other connections with our community. Cindy Jeriga is our music director, and I'd like to thank Janice Peters and Diane Cowley for lighting the Christ candle today. And I'd like to thank the Hamilton family for reading today's scripture. And finally, thank you to the Stevenson family for adding the wise ones to their nativity scene today. We come together today to reflect on who we are as a Christmas people. What drives us as a Christmas people? Our faith, actions, and most importantly, the Christmas miracle and the greatest gift of ever, Jesus' love. Let us pray. Greatest God, as we gather on this beautiful Christmas morning, remind us of the many ways that you show your love to us every day. Remind us in the brightness of the fresh fallen snow. Remind us in the joys our families and friends bring us. Remind us in the smiles our neighbors and strangers give us. Remind us of the identity that our religion and faith give us. Also remind us to offer our love to others in this world of, in our words and in our faith actions every day. We thank you for the gifts of love and faith, the gift of friendship, the gift of neighbors, the gift of our faith community. As we gather to celebrate today, open our minds to your message, open our ears to your musical sounds of the Christmas birth, and open our hearts to your unconditional love that we are to share all year round. We ask this in Jesus' name, our first Christmas gift ever. We will now have our slides provided by Lori. The Stevenson family will add the wise ones to their nativity scene, and the Hamilton family will read today's scripture lesson.
it's so wonderful to give gifts and watch those we care about open them. When we receive gifts, it's so nice to feel the thoughtfulness of each one. The wise men brought gifts to the baby Jesus of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They studied the stars and believed that the special star would show them where a new king would be born. So they brought gifts that showed that they believed in Jesus as king. They saw a special star in the sky and followed it from the far east to find where Jesus was. Imagine how tough that trip was. And on camels? The Christmas stories remind us that Jesus came for ordinary people like shepherds and innkeepers and for strangers near and far like the wise men. Jesus was God's way of sending love to everyone. The wise men coming to see Jesus reminds us how important it is to include everyone in God's circle of love. Did you know that this is Lori's nativity set, which we borrowed? It was made for her by a special person who made it unpainted so that the figures have no nationality or gender. They include everyone. I hope you're having a happy holiday. Today's reading is from Luke 2, verses 21 to 40. A week later, when the time came for the baby to be circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name which the angel had given him before he had been conceived. The time came for Joseph and Mary to perform the ceremony of purification, as the law of Moses commanded. So they took the child to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written, written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be dedicated to the Lord. They also went to offer a sacrifice of a pair of doves or two young pigeons, as required by the law of the Lord. At that time, there was a man named Simeon living in Jerusalem. He was a good, God-fearing man and was waiting for Israel to be saved. The Holy Spirit was with him and had assured him that he would not die before he had been seen the Lord's promised Messiah. Led by the Spirit, Simeon went into the temple. When the parents brought the child Jesus into the temple to do for him what the law required, Simeon took the child in his arms and gave thanks to God. Now, Lord, you have kept your promise, and you may let your servant go in peace. With my own eyes I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light to reveal your, your will to the Gentiles, and bring glory to your people, Israel. Israel. The child's father and mother were amazed by the things Simeon said about him. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is chosen by God for the destruction and the salvation of many in Israel. He will be a sign from God which many people will speak against, and so reveal their secret thoughts. And sorrow, like a sharp sword, will break your own heart. There was a very old prophet, a widow named Anna, daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She had been married for only seven years and was 84 years old. She never left the temple. Day and night, she worshiped God, fasting and praying. That very same hour, she arrived and gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were waiting for God to set Jerusalem free. When Joseph and Mary had finished doing all that was required by the law of the Lord, they returned to their hometown of Nazareth in Galilee. The child grew and became strong. He was full of wisdom, and God's blessings were upon him. Hello, St. Andrews members and friends. I'm pleased to join you online to share with you some of the thoughts I have had after 55 years of ordained ministry. About 25 years ago, one began to hear people making comments like, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. At that time, that comment upset me a lot, but not anymore. My way of thinking about many things has changed, particularly about the language we use to describe our relationship to God and God's creation. I often complain about the careless way language is used within Christianity. For some, it doesn't make any difference. For others, it seems like nonsense, and they turn their backs on the whole thing. 
So today I want to direct our thoughts towards some of the words that I feel are regularly abused and thus misunderstood. Those words are religion, beliefs, faith, spirituality, incarnation, and God. The most commonly misused word is religion and its adjective religious. Religion has to do with our identity and religious has to do with the rituals we follow to make our identity concrete. Without rituals, we would have no way of expressing our identity. This morning's gospel lesson gives us a perfect example of religious practice for precisely that reason. On the eighth day after Jesus' birth, he was taken to the temple for ritual cleansing and to be circumcised as required by Jewish tradition. This ritual included the sacrifice of two doves. All of this was religious activity. It was entirely meant to seal Jesus' identity as a member of the house of David. The boy Jesus and the man he would become would be forever identified as Jewish. There was nothing magical about it, everything except the words spoken was very secular and entirely human. It was Jewish initiation, pure and simple. Nothing supernatural or magical, and that was good. In our tradition, of course, baptism and confirmation are the religious ceremonies that mark our initiation into the Christian, the Christian faith community. Some people believe that at the instant of baptism, something magically changes between God and the one baptized, that somehow the act of baptism makes God love that person in a way that God didn't a moment earlier. That is superstition. There is nothing that human beings can do on earth that can in any way influence God. God is constant, unchangeable. Whatever changes occur, even when we pray, happen within us and perhaps those around us. Religion and religious ceremonies are necessary in all of our lives. And I contend that every person has at least one religion of some sort, though not necessarily one that focuses upon faith in God. Religion is the thing that gives one one's identity, maybe a profession or a hobby or a political loyalty. The religions we choose identify us. Closely related to our religion is another word that is often carelessly used, namely believe or beliefs. Some people believe in flying saucers. Some people believe in ghosts. Some people believe that God and heaven are up in the sky. People believe all sorts of things which may or may not have anything to do with the way they live. Many when asked about their beliefs, reply that they believe in themselves. Self-confidence is important, but we must always remember that we are all part of the interrelated universe that is much larger than ourselves. What does have to do with the way we live is our faith, another word that is often misused. Faith is a power word. Without it, we would do absolutely nothing. Without faith, we would not dare to stand up because we could not be sure that our feet would support us. Without faith, we would not flip light switches because we would not expect the light to come on. The most simple things in life depend upon rudimentary faith. At that level, we don't usually think of it in terms of faith in God. But faith is involved in everything that we do, and God is involved in everything we do, large and small, even if we say that we don't believe in God. Faith is the power to act. Faith is also the human instinct for meaning. Belief is a part of it, but beliefs are superficial. Faith is at the core of our being and shapes our relationships and our actions. Beliefs are in our heads, faith is in our hearts and hands. Closely related to our faith 
is our spirituality. In fact, the words might be used interchangeably. Webster's dictionary definition of spirituality is animating or vital principle in man and animals. Our spirituality describes our real value system, what actually motivates us, as opposed to what we might claim to believe when we're holding forth in a coffee shop or a bar. Liturgically speaking, the Sunday after Christmas is Christmas Sunday. And for me, the basic meaning of this season is wrapped up in the word Emmanuel, which literally translated means God is with us, incarnation in the flesh. Incarnation is another word that is often diminished, so much so that it has really communicated a separation between God and us. We talk about the incarnation when God became visible to the world in and through Jesus, born of Mary. But then, through many of our hymns and sermons and prayers, we're content to leave the incarnation way back there in Bethlehem. But Bethlehem was just the beginning. The incarnation tells us that God carries out God's work in the world through all people. Where there is love, there is God. You and I are the incarnation whenever we allow God's love to be expressed through our words and actions. A present day example is loving one another by protecting others from the COVID-19 infection. In my opinion, the concept of incarnation, the central message of the Christmas story, is all but ignored in much of what we do during this season each year. We tend to either get stuck in discussions about the conditions of Jesus' birth, how he was conceived, how old Mary was, what was a stable like, what did the, where did the shepherds and angels come from. But somehow we rarely talk about the fact that this was God's way of telling the world that the Spirit of God is not something that is remote or out of touch, God's Spirit is within us and around us, waiting for us to give it expression through everything we do. We cannot escape God's presence. It is our choice whether or not to respond. When we do, that is incarnation. That is what is modeled in the one born in the manger. He was unique in the way that he consistently lived his life in harmony with God's Spirit. The Old and New Testaments emphasize that that Spirit is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 sums it up succinctly where it says, God is love. Unconditional, creative, redemptive love. And that brings us to the biggest word that has been brought into disrepute, God. And it has been done by ascribing human attributes to that spiritual reality. By doing that, we place huge limitations upon God. We assume that God is going to think like a human being and is going to do what humans do. Virtually every human race and culture has re recognized the existence of something beyond ourselves that keeps things together and moves us on. Jewish, Christian, and Muslim faith groups describe that in terms of one omnipotent God. North American First Nations people likewise recognize one great spirit. Other worldwide cultures break that overarching power into different categories and acknowledge many gods. The point here is that recognition of ultimate reality in, is innate in all races and cultures of people. We differ only in the ways in which we identify and revere that reality. Even much of the scientific community recognizes that there is a fundamental reality that they still do not fully understand. To describe it, they use such terms as cosmological constant or dark energy. So, 
while religious communities and scientific communities use very different language and different imagery, we really focus our sense of awe and wonder on the same reality. Now then, we come back to the words of Scripture. In the fourth chapter of Galatians, we read, When the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem or save those who were under the law. And concludes, So you are no longer a slave, but a child, and if a child, then also an heir through God. I believe the words, in the fullness of time, simply mean that conditions were right for the message of incarnation to be heard and accepted. The notion of serving God by obeying endless rules and rituals had been dragging people down. People's understanding of God was way too small. The time had come for a child to be born who would transform the world's understanding of what it means to love God. Up to then, God had been understood as being remote, very much the old man in the sky, at once caring but judgmental, at once forgiving but condemning. The Christ child brought a new way of thinking. A few years ago, a woman named Phyllis Tickle published a book entitled The Great Emergence in which she claims that some significant transformation occurs within the church every 500 years, and that just such a transformation is happening now. Her theory received widespread enthusiastic acceptance, for there's no question that much is changing at the present time. However, some serious church historians have pointed out that important changes have occurred much more often than at 500 year intervals. Nonetheless, the year 2017 marked the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And whether by coincidence or design, we are in this decade being pushed into finding new and better ways of understanding what it means to be a Christian. In my opinion, that must begin with our focusing upon the meaning of the Christmas story. Although the Gospel of John does not contain an account of Jesus' birth, the first chapter beautifully sums up its meaning in these words, and the Word became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. The Word is the presence of God, the flesh is Jesus. Who demonstrated what it means to let the Spirit of God live through us. That is the Incarnation. Though the Church in the future may look very different from what we know, it will be the Church only so long as its members continue to express God's creating and healing love through their lives. Words and activities no matter how pompous or pious, don't count. Only things that make a difference do. Mary and Joseph followed the traditional religious rituals that gave Jesus his Jewish identity. A constant reminder that he belonged to that great community of God's people. And there's no question that he faithfully honored that identity throughout his life. Pious religious rituals like Jewish circumcision or Christian baptism and communion are absolutely essential to remind us who we are and whose we are. Religious rituals are meant to keep us grounded in our faith. That is all. But people who put all of their energy in performing religious rituals in hope of pleasing God deceive themselves. True faith is expressed not by rituals, but by living out principles and values. They are spelled out clearly by St. Paul in his letter to the Christians in Philippi. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, 
whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, think about these things. Think about these things. As we move into another year, the season of making resolutions, that is good advice to follow. For it is the things we think about that evolve into our actions, and it is our constant actions that verify the depth of our spirituality. For Jesus, the religious ritual of his circumcision as a newborn never ceased to be a compass in the fulfillment of his life's mission. Likewise, baptism, confirmation, and communion are for us. That is not to say that people who have not been baptized and confirmed cannot be Christ's followers. But having those significant markers in our lives is a help, for human beings depend upon symbols, religious and otherwise. The symbolism of religious activities is important to give us our identity but they are only symbols. It is our faith that gives direction to the way we live. The closing words of today's gospel lesson make clear that Jesus modeled that throughout his life. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was with him. Amen. Let us take a moment to pray. Gracious God, we celebrate the birth of Jesus this week. As we do, we give you thanks for the care that we find ourselves around and care that we can give as your loving servants. We thank you for our faith community, our church, our friends. Even though we are apart at this very special time of the year, we are thankful that we are able to come together in this unique way. We also thank you for your loving forgiveness. May we find it within our power to generously offer forgiveness to our friends and family and strangers whose transgressions affront us. Help us to gain identity through our religion, comfort in our beliefs, and everlasting life through our faith actions. As we enter this phase of lockdown, help those of us who live alone to reach out to others when we feel lonely. Help those of us who are suffering, suffering from COVID, suffering from anxiety, suffering from fear. We ask a special comfort for those of us who have experienced loss this year and find it difficult to celebrate the birth of Jesus this year. We ask a special Christmas blessing for our friends in the LGBTQ community as we continue our path to becoming a faith-affirming ministry of the United Church. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Please let anyone who may not have access to our service through the internet that our services will return to Cable 14 in the new year. We hope that you are enjoying the Christmas season as best you can this year. And today's blessing comes from the words of Howard Thurman. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and the princes are home, when the shepherds are back with the flocks, then the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal those broken in spirit, to feed the hungry, to release the oppressed, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among all peoples, to make a little music with the heart, and to radiate the light of Christ every day, in every way, in all that we do and in all that we say. Then the work of Christmas begins. Blessings to all of you. Thank you.